my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I am your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora, and today I have with me Dr. Michael Bruce. Michael, how are you? I am excellent, Michael. How are you? I am fantastic. It's beautiful here in the People's Republic of New Jersey. <laughs> uh, let me read Michael's bio, and then we're going to get right into it. He's written a phenomenal book called The Power of When, but I just want to give you a little background on Michael. Michael J. Bruce, Ph.D., is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomate of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was one of the youngest people to have passed the board at age 31 with a specialty in sleep disorders and is one of only 163 psychologists in the world with his credentials and distinction. Dr. Bruce is on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz Show and appears regularly on the show. In addition to his new book, The Power of When, Dr. Bruce is the author of The Sleep Doctor's Diet Plan, Lose Weight, through better sleep a groundbreaking book discussing the science and relationship between quality sleep and metabolism and his first book is good night the sleep doctor's four-week program to sleep better and better health an amazon top 100 bestseller has been met with rave reviews and continues to change the lives of readers it is now available in paperback as beauty sleep look younger lose weight and feel great through better sleep michael welcome to the show Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. So could you give folks um, a little a little background story and you could tell people about your journey? I'm happy to. So I have a PhD in clinical psychology and I'm board certified in clinical sleep disorders. So I did something a little bit different. I actually took a medical specialty board without going to medical school and I passed. And so that's why there's only 160 whatever of us that have ever done that because just not a whole lot of people have had the opportunity um, or the stupidity maybe <laughs> <laughs> to try to take a medical board without going to medical school. Um, and uh, so I'm an actively practicing sleep specialist. I have been for the last 17 years and I work in conjunction with physicians and we treat everything from apnea to narcolepsy to insomnia, um, kind of all of those areas. But my specialty turns out to be insomnia. Um, and uh, the, the whole impetus for the new book, The Power of When, actually came from working with my patients. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll t I'd like to tell the story of kind of the one, one of the patients that really was kind of the seminal, um, you know, a area that kind of brought me forward to this idea. Fire away. So I had a patient come in about three years ago, uh, maybe a little longer, and uh, she said, um, you know, I've tried all the stuff that you've been talking to me about. She had been a patient of mine for, you know, a couple of weeks. And quite honestly, my techniques were not working, not not even close. Um, and so I, I'm like a dog with a bone. You know, I really want to um, figure that out and, and kind of make sure that people are doing well. Because generally speaking, my techniques work really, really well. And, um, and so I said, all right, well, let, let's get back to basics here. And she said, well, look, Dr. Bruce, it's not that I have a hard time falling asleep. And it's not that I have a hard time staying asleep. She said, I sleep at the wrong time. I said, the wrong time? I'm like, hold on a second. Let's, let's kind of delve a little bit deeper into that idea. And so she said, you know, if it was up to me, I'd go to bed at 2 and I'd wake up at 9. And then I'd be perfect. Hmm. And so, you know, I had heard of people having what's called shift work sleep disorder, right, where you work at night and you sleep during the day. But that wasn't this. And then I had heard of people having what was called delayed sleep phase syndrome, where their body had uh, had kind of forced them into a different a desynchronous schedule. Um, and then I also knew that I had two teenagers at home. And both of my teenagers actually would love to be on this woman's preferred schedule because <laughs> that's what teenagers do, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> you know, they like to stay up late and they like to sleep late. And so I said, I said, I don't think you have insomnia. I said, I think you've got something else. And I said you know, would you feel comfortable with me calling up your boss and talking with him um, about you changing your work schedule? And she was like, well, I'm about to get fired, so you might as well. <laughs> and I thought she was kidding. And when I called her boss, she wasn't kidding. So I talked to the boss and he said, look, let me tell you, I, um, I'm not very happy with her performance. Things aren't going well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I need to come up with something or she's not going to have a job any longer. And I said, can she just come in about two hours later and leave about two hours later. And he said, I'm willing to try anything at this point. I said, good, let's do that. I'll let her know and I'll call you back in a week. Called him back in a week and he said, I don't know what you did, but she has changed completely. 
She's showing up at the new time. She's participating in meetings. Her work product is fantastic. He's like, she's a changed person. He's like, what did you do? And I said, I, I didn't do anything. You changed her work schedule and re- made it more consistent with what I think is her chrono rhythm. So she was a, a, a very, an outlier, if you will, for what I call a wolf or a very big night owl, right? So many people out there may have heard of the term early bird versus night owl. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what chronotypes are. And so we started to wonder. So I, I was calling her back to tell her the good news and her husband got on the phone and he said, I don't know what you did. But I like my wife more. <laughs> right? That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's a pretty strong statement, right? I like my wife more. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. He said she's getting along better with me. She's getting along better with the kids. He said it's the whole thing is working out much, much better for us. And I was like, wow, okay. Um, so I'm like, that's fascinating. So what what I what I learned um, which was which was equally as, as interesting was is that she started to notice that while she was at work There were certain activities that she found that she did better at certain times of the day like she was kind of finding what she called her time zones mm-hmm. And so she has her own personal time zones, right? And so not only was she a, a super duper night owl again wanting to stay up until two and sleep until nine um, but inside her day she found that there were certain times that actually made more sense to do certain things she was better at them and so I said, this is fascinating. So I went into the literature and I found over 300 studies showing that this is something that is very, very real called chronotypes. And, um, but what was fascinating to me was I didn't feel like that the, the current assessment was accurate because all it ever assessed for was were you an early bird or were you a night owl? But what about everybody in between? And what about people who didn't sleep so well who were my true insomniacs? And um, and so I said, well, there's no assessment tool for this. Then I'm going to create one. And so I started looking at all of the literature and and developing my quiz. And so for people out there, if you want to learn what your chronotype is, if you go to the power of when quiz dot com, and that'll be in the show notes, mm-hmm. um, you can learn which one of the four different chronotypes you are. Now, that's all fun and interesting. And it's like, oh, that's cool. But what I've done that's taken it one step further is once I know your chronotype, I know what your hormone distribution is um, during a day because I know when your body wants to wake up and when your body wants to go to sleep. And hormones run on a very predictable schedule. We know when cortisol generally is high, we know when testosterone is low, when melatonin is high, things like that. And so what I did was I took 50 different daily activities and I said, what hormones do I need for these activities? And then I matched it up and it fell into sync Perfectly. It was like a lock and key. It was unbelievable, Michael. And and so that's how the power of when came to be. And so not only do you learn your chronotypes and learn when you should be going to bed and when you should be waking up, um, but you also learn when's the best time to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, run a mile, you, you name it. I, I love that. A um, couple of things that you said. Chrono rhythm. Uh-huh. Just describe that briefly for, for our audience. Sure. So a chronotype is um, a categorization, right? Whether you're a a wolf or a lion or a bear or a dolphin, and we'll get into that. The chrono rhythm is the actual actual circadian rhythm that's going on in your body. So so there's a little clock inside your brain that kind of runs the schedule. Uh, The way I think of it is, uh, Michael, you you said you're from the, the great, or you're living currently in the great state of New Jersey. Is that correct? That is correct. So I, I'm assuming that you've been to Grand Central Station before? A couple of times. <laughs> okay. So so Grand Central Station is a really interesting place because there are literally hundreds of trains coming in at any given time, right? And they've got all these different tracks, but Grand Central is the hub. So I want everybody to think of their main circadian rhythm or their internal biological clock as Grand Central Station. But yet there are so many different trains coming in and out. If any one of those trains gets off track, it screws up all everything and you get this huge log jam. That's exactly how it works in your head is there's this place in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, I'm not expecting anybody to know that, much less figure out how to spell it because it's, it's kind of tough to do. Um, but understand that there's a clock that times all of these different things. So it times your digestion. So it tells you when to eat. It times your sleep. So it times your melatonin. It times your immune function so you can ward off disease. It times your heart rate so you can be more athletic at certain times. I mean, all of these signals are coming from this one central clock in your brain, and it hits all these other clocks. Turns out there's almost a 100 clocks 
throughout your body. Every wow. organ system has a clock. Every disease state has a clock. It's, it's very, very interesting. And all these signals are coming in. And so the circadian rhythm or the chrono rhythm, if you will, is that, is that ability, is that time that passes for each individual organ system and what occurs during that time. Brilliant. Okay. So here's the big reveal that I'm waiting for. Can you describe your unique perspective and break down what you call chronotypes? Absolutely. So when we look at chronotypes, um, here's what we know is we know there's an early bird and we know there's a night owl. Now, first of all, I'm not a bird. I'm a mammal. And so I wanted, I didn't want to be related to a bird. I wanted to be related to uh, a mammal so that I could kind of relate and, and, and understand it. And I actually chose, by the way, animals that have these very specific rhythms. So early bird gets replaced with a lion. Okay. And my lions um, are my people that wake up at 530 in the morning and go to bed by 839 o'clock at night. As, as an example, they have several other characteristics. And I'll tell you what those are in a minute. Um, my wolves replace the night owl. And so I, I happen to personally be a wolf. I'm, I'm, a night, I'm a late night person. I never go to bed before midnight. Um, I get up around 6, 37 o'clock. I don't actually require a lot of sleep. I only need about six and a half hours. So by the way, everybody out there, eight hours is a myth. <laughs> um, very few people actually need exactly eight hours. I, I've been a six and a half hour sleeper almost my entire life. Um, and um, that, that works for me. That 12 to 6.30 works for me. Uh, there's people in between, uh, which is the majority of the population. I call them bears. And then there's people who are poor sleepers, and I call them dolphins. Now, the reason I call my poor sleepers dolphins is most people don't know this, but dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. And I thought that was a really good representation of people who don't sleep very well, in and out of sleep, um, ne never quite into the depths of sleep. So now I'm going to break the categories down by personality type and by population. So lions represent approximately 15% of the population. My lions are my COOs of a company. They're my leaders. These are my type A personalities who start a list every morning and they check things off their list as they go throughout their day. And by the way, they don't like to go from the first item on the list to the middle of their list. They like to go from the first item to the second item to the third item to the fourth item. They're, they're a little bit on the um, anal compulsive side, if you will. But they're very, very productive, um, and lots of people out there want to be a lion. That being said, lions don't have it as easy as you might think. Um, lions are, have a difficult time socially because they're exhausted by 8.30 at night. I mean, they've been up since you know 5.30 in the morning, and so for them, so they, they oftentimes have significant social issues, meaning um, they can't go to dinner in a movie because they're asleep by the time the movie's on, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not, it, so it's not all fun and games being a lion. Um, bears represent about 50, 55 percent of the population. That, that's the largest group. One out of two people is actually a bear. Um, and bears are great. Bears have a tendency to be more extroverted. Uh, bears have a tendency to be uh, kind of good go with the flow kind of people. Bears get work done. Um, bears have a good idea of what work and life balance looks like. They kind of like to work hard and play hard as well. Um, and bears are the fun people to sit down with at lunch, right? And so they're the ones who are telling the funny story or know the office gossip. Um, bears are really good friends and have a tendency to be really loyal companions. Uh, wolves, like myself, we're the night people. And, and we, believe it or not, tend to be very introverted. Um, but, but interestingly, we have a creative outlet that usually helps us out quite a bit. We have a tendency to be... Um, the artists and the uh, the musicians and the writers and the actors of the world. Um, and so we let our inner creativity out in, in different ways as opposed to being extroverted at a party. Uh, and by the way, we don't like to show up at your party until 11 o'clock at night because that's really when we get going, right? Um, we hate mornings. We don't like to eat breakfast. Um, we are, we're miserable in the early morning. Like it's best if you just don't even speak to us until about 10 o'clock. And, um, but, but if you wait, you're going to see something really interesting. You'll, you'll see a lot of creativity. You'll see a lot of, uh, of interest, a lot of intellect and things like that. My dolphins are, are also my type A personalities, similar to my lions. They're highly intelligent, but my dolphins have got a little too much obsessive compulsive nature to them. And oftentimes um, they don't actually complete tasks because they're so busy trying to get every detail done. And so they have a productivity issue oftentimes because they, if it's not perfect, it's not done to them. Um, and uh, and they, they can have some pretty significant issues 
uh, with their sleep. They make up about yeah, about 15, 10 to 15% of the population as well. It's really interesting, as I, I was speaking before we got on with, with you, Michael, that my wife and I both read your book, loved the book, and then had the discussion on where we thought we felt. And she felt she was a bear because she was extroverted, and she is fun, and she is funny, tells great stories. But she's the one up at 530. She's the one who is, I would say she's the COO, and she really fits into that. She does have some bear tendencies, mm -hmm. but it's just interesting in talking to you, and I can see so why she was thinking that she was more of a bear, and then she took the test and it said bear. She wasn't happy with those results, mm -hmm. I will tell you. She wanted to be a lion. <laughs> so, so first of all, lots of people have what I call lion envy, okay? <laughs> where they want to be a lion. And also remember, this is all on a continuum, right? Yes. And so bears can have a lion, lionishness, if you will, or wolfishness, depending upon where they are in their life. And by the way, you know, your chronorhythm changes over time. So when you're younger, like we were talking about my teenagers, my all, almost all teenagers are wolves. Mm. They like to stay up late and they like to sleep late. Um, whereas um, as, as, as we get older, uh, I'm 48 years old, but as I start to approach my 50s and mid 50s, what I will find is I'll have a tendency to move more towards a lion or more towards a dolphin um, because I'll want to go to bed earlier, get up earlier. My sleep may be more disrupted due to medical frailty or medications I might take or things like that. So there's there it, it stays stable from about age 20 to about age 50. OK. So. Denise, just so you know, you're you're still a lion, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> you're a lion in everybody's eyes. <laughs> exactly. Um, talk talk a little bit about that um, the sleep and alertness patterns. I think that's really important because we're we're seeing. I, I want to say, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of that movie when we were younger, um, Field of Dreams, where the brother-in-law turns around and he's like, where do all those players come from? That's what I feel like what's going on with sleep. Like, oh, nobody talked about sleep, the, the machismo, I'll sleep when I'm dead, I've got stuff to do. Right. But what right. you're saying and what makes sense and more and more research is out there is how important sleep is. And obviously, for, for these creatures, chronotypes, sleep is completely different. So could you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Absolutely. So sleep is the anchor, right, to almost everything. I mean, I would argue that, you you know, you've got all these people out there now talking about wellness. I, I would argue that, in fact, you can't have wellness without good sleep. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the data is very consistent that sleep and sleep deprivation affect diet, um, your ability to gain and lose weight, even your food choice is directly affected by sleep deprivation. We know that exercise is directly affected by um, sleep deprivation. The effort that you feel in exercising is directly affected by that. So, so we know that sleep becomes the anchor, right? And so what's interesting about sleep for the different chronotypes is it's actually, it's actually kind of different. So what I can do, let's go through, um, if, if we can, the, uh, we'll go through each one's schedule. Yeah, so absolutely. I've got them. I'm yeah. going to lay them out here. So my lion, right? So my lion is the person that wakes up around 5.30 in the morning and goes to bed um, usually around, you know, quite honestly, maybe 10, 10.30 at night. I mean, that's lights out, you know, head to the pillow, that kind of thing. They're done. Um, and, and quite honestly, the last probably hour and a half to two hours that they're awake, don't bother discussing anything important with them because, quite frankly, they're, they're not going to get there. Their, their brain is kind of, you know, melted by then. Yep. Um, my bears will um, actually wake up around 7. So big difference between a lion and a bear. Uh, lions wake up around 5.30ish. Bears are waking up closer to 7. But my bears won't go to bed until 11, 11.30 in some cases, right? So they fall more into the general schedule. By the way, it's a bear's world. Um, you know, there's most social schedules are built around a bear and their tendency to be awake or asleep at particular times. Because, again, there's so many of them. One out of two people is a bear. Sure. Um, Wolves um, have a tendency to wake up, you know, 730, maybe even closer to eight, all depending upon their job. Right. So if your job is forcing you to get up at a particular time, well, that's that's a different story. Um, and and by the way, wolves don't go to bed until midnight. I mean, uh, you know, I try to get them to just turn their screens off by 11 
and sometimes that can be a chore. But yeah, um, bear. Uh, I'm sorry, wolves will go to bed around midnight, and then dolphins are my problem children, right? And so <laughs> dolphins, uh, you know, if I can get a dolphin to stay in bed and sleep for six and a half to seven hours, I've usually performed a miracle. But they get up around six thirty, uh, and then you, they're usually going to bed around eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. Eleven thirty to twelve. I am writing down rapidly. Uh, so. In, in working with these folks and being able to chronotype, do you see people embracing that? Because to me, this makes a hell of a lot of sense. And you know, <laughs> seriously, like you, if you get, if you get, for example, a wolf, that's why kids have a really hard time in school. And you yes. see them when they get to college, you you happen to notice that they are all taking, you know, 11 a.m. classes. Yeah, and and that's and you're exactly right. And so um, it's it's quite fascinating to kind of see how people um, adapt, if you will. And and some people, but you know, like that patient I was telling you about before, she she had a really hard time because her whole world was, you know, her boss wanted her at the office by eight, you know, and that just wasn't going to work for her. Um, and it's hard because, as an example, as a wolf, sometimes people think I'm lazy, right? They're like, well. Why, why do you get to sleep until, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock? And, and it's like, because if you want me to produce exactly what you need me to produce, then you need to allow me to do that at that time. And people have been adopting, you know, it's interesting because people will adopt the sleep schedule first. And that's where I always tell people to start. Interesting. Is yeah. Start with, start with getting your sleep as close to this schedule as you can. Obviously, you got to get your boss's approval or your spouse's approval or what have you. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead and get that. And then I have them adopt the sleep schedule first because, quite honestly, it's not fun to try to fool Mother Nature. I mean, it just doesn't work very well. You know, this is a genetically predetermined aspect of your life. It's all based on something called the PER3 gene, which is a clock gene that um, is uh, in your genetic makeup. And it actually talks, it actually tells your brain how much sleep you need uh, and when you go to sleep, uh, which is kind of fascinating. But it absolutely is probably one of the hallmarks of it. And if you if you start with the sleep, then all, all the other things seem to fall in place because, it, again, it represents the anchor because once you awaken, that's when certain hormones are going to kind of kick in. Once you go to sleep, that's when other hormones are going to kick in. So it's, it's really all based around the sleep. Fascinating. And I, I, I look at myself as a bear with some wolf tendencies. I, I would, I would stay up till one in the morning. And as I'm now 51, I push that back to where I'm in bed by midnight. I really don't have any problems falling asleep or staying asleep. But if I were left to my own, I would be up till two in the morning. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> No yeah, problem. so you you're definitely got some wolfishness to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I start seeing patients at 10 o'clock, and I'm very thankful for that, and I think they're very thankful for that, that they don't see me at 8 o'clock. Right. Well, <laughs> and quite honestly, would you really be all that effective at 8 o'clock, you know? Uh, my wife would tell you, not much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, my guess is, and, and so, you know, I find the same thing with me. Like, I don't have, you know, 8 a.m. appointments for insomnia anymore, even though my insomniacs are usually up by then is because I'm not going to be as effective as I could be at that point. You know, I need to be, have, be on my game, you know, because, Absolutely. you know, this this stuff is, you know, it's important. I mean, you know, what you do, what I do, you know, we're, we always try to do it our, to our best ability because we're, we're dealing with health here. You know, we're dealing with human suffering and health and, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not something to fool around with, you know. And so when I, what I think of it is, is, is look at your levels of productivity and you'd be shocked at um, how much better attention you pay to detail, how many how many better decisions that you make? All, all of those things are factors. It is amazing. Um, do you, another thing I wanted to talk about real quick. One of my great passions is napping. Where does that fall in the continuum that we're talking about? So certain chronotypes are better to nap than others. Um, so that's number one. Lions actually are great nappers um, because you know they've been up since five thirty in the morning, and so finding a per, a good time for them to nap. And I actually have an entire um, section of the book on napping as a matter of fact um but for as an example we never we never want dolphins to nap and the reason why is because they're already not great sleepers and so if they start napping in the middle of the day what we know is that it's going to make it much more difficult for them to fall asleep that night 
Interesting. Where where do uh, wolves and and bears fall in that continuum? So it's interesting, right? And so um, when you when you're looking at them in particular, um, what I would say is for lions, a nap time of around one thirty for about twenty five minutes would be mm-hmm. perfect. Yep. Um, for bears, that their napping is going to be a little bit later, maybe around two o'clock. Um, and by the way, um, one of the things that people out there need to know is that somewhere between one and three in the afternoon. People get tired. Mm-hmm. And so the question becomes, well, why do people get tired between 1 and 3 in the afternoon? The answer is, in fact, there's a slight core body temperature drop that occurs biologically during that period of time. And that's a signal for your brain to release melatonin. And so you get a little bit of a melatonin spike between 1 and 3 in the afternoon. That is why you get tired. It's not that you had a big pasta, you know, bowl of pasta for lunch or a piece of pizza or something like that with a lot of carbs, although carbs can make you sleepy. Um, it really has more to do with the biology of it. And so somewhere between 1 and 3 in the afternoon is the best napping time. And, of course, we know this from a cultural perspective because what happens in Latin American countries during that time? Oh, everybody takes a siesta. Exactly, <laughs> right? And that happens to be biologically driven, right? So bears can use that to their advantage and nap around 2 o'clock. Wolves, wolves are not – naps are not ideal for wolves, um, generally speaking, because what ends up happening – is if they nap, they want to have a tendency to nap much later, like four or five o'clock in the afternoon, mm. um, which is kind of like their three o'clock. Sure. And um, it makes them stay up even later. So if you're a wolf and you got to get a nap, um, then stick to a bear bearish time around two two fifteen, and that's going to be better for you. I I joke that you know I I'm like very similar to you. It's six and a half to seven hours, maybe tops. But if I take a nap in that, in, and my naps generally run at least an hour to an hour and a half, I am I, I am stellar. Like I am I am the rocket scientist that I think I am after that nap. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it depends on the length of your nap. Have you ever taken a nap and felt worse, not better? Yeah. It's usually when the dog's barking and it's like twenty minutes, and yeah, then exactly. it is you know it actually feels like a hangover. Yeah, and so what happens is is for some people, that's a little short generally speaking, but generally for most people, if you nap longer than about 20, 25 minutes, your body goes into a deeper stage of sleep, and it's just harder to get out of that deep stage of sleep. And so we get you get what we call sleep inertia, Mm. which is just sort of this carryover of sleepiness that seems to – that has a tendency to occur then. Um, And so I recommend generally speaking a 25-minute nap, but I'm going to teach everybody here today a trick that I use with my Fortune 100 CEOs all the time. All right, well, lay that. We love takeaways, so lay right. that on us, please. So I call this a nap a latte, all right? So here's what you do, is you go and you get a cup of drip coffee, right? Um, because drip coffee has the highest caffeine content of any other, um, a- a- any other caffeinated beverage, about 110 milligrams. You put about two or three ice cubes in it to cool it down so that you can drink it. You drink the entire thing very, very quickly, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, And then you take your 25-minute nap. You will have reduced the amount of sleep drive that was making you sleepy. Uh, The caffeine is just kicking in. You're good for four hours, guaranteed. Very nice. I love it. I love it. Um... (laughs) That was fantastic. So... Where can people find you in the world, Michael? I, I love the concept that you laid out there. We're coming to the end of the rainbow. Um, tell people where they can find you in the world, where they could find your books, and also please let them know again about the quiz. Absolutely. So if you want to take the quiz, which I recommend that everybody does, go to the power of when w h e n quiz dot com. And you can take the quiz. Um, if you want to buy the book, it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all those great places. Um, the book will really gives you a lot of detail, and it'll tell you, like, I mean, the best time to have sex, the best time to drink a cup of coffee, the best time to eat a cheeseburger, um, you name it. Um, the best time to ask your boss for a raise is in there too, by the way. Mm, um, very good. And then if you want to just learn more about me and what I do, uh, my website is thesleepdoctor.com. Beautiful. All right. I can't let you go without talking about when's the best time to have coffee. You, I'm sorry. You can't get off the phone. No I problem. need to know. Tell me. Tell us all. When okay. I Because all the time is the best time to have coffee, right? <laughs> no, it's not. 
So here's what's fascinating is if when you wake up in the morning, your adrenaline and your cortisol are at their highest level because that's what actually pulls you in out of a state of unconsciousness and brings you a, into a, a waking state. You have to have high level of cortisol, high level of adrenaline. When you look and compare the, uh, the, the powerfulness, if you will, of adrenaline and cortisol to caffeine, it's like comparing cocaine to weak tea, mm. right? So caffeine is very low in terms of how powerful it is compared to these hormones that are already endogenous and in your system. So the very first thing that you should drink in the morning is not a cup of coffee. It should be about 8 to 12 ounces of water. Most people don't know, but as you breathe out at, at, while you're sleeping at night, you actually breathe out almost a full liter of water. So you wake up dehydrated. Caffeine's a diuretic. So if you drink caffeine or coffee in the morning, you're actually telling your body to pee more, which means you're going to get even more dehydrated. Drink an 8 to 12 ounce glass of water when you wake up. And then approximately 90 minutes after you wake up, that is when you're naturally your adrenaline and cortisol begin to go down. And so if you add caffeine at that point, you will actually naturally lift it back up and give yourself more of an energetic state. So between, nine, between 90 and 120 minutes after you wake up is the perfect time for your first cup of coffee. 90 to 120 minutes. Perfect. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, thank you for that. That's a, another takeaway, folks. Um, so thank you, Michael, so much for being on the show. I uh, greatly appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to talk to us in our community. Folks, oh, happy to do it. Oh, thank you. Folks, if you've liked what you heard, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star review. Uh, help us to help you so that more people understand and hear what um, what we're saying. And Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Ciao.